When we are on a beach strewn with seashells, it's sometimes hard to believe that all of them were once part of a living animal. They were either part of a single-shelled animal called a gastropod or a bivalve that consists of two parts. When is the best time to see live shells on Sanibel? During a low tide. There are usually two low tides every day, one in the morning and one later in the day. The morning low tide is usually the lowest of the two. The lowest tides of the month are when there is a full moon or a new moon. The tide is very low on this December morning. It's just before daybreak, and the reflection of the moon can be seen in the tide pool where this mother and daughter are looking for shells. The lowest tides of the year begin mid-November and continue through March. The person you see walking in the distance is walking on a sandbar at low tide. There is a good low tide this morning, so let's go to the beach and see what we can find. By the way, did you know that gastropods have some of the same organs like we do? And that includes eyes. If there was an award in the shelling world for being cute, this three inch Florida fighting conch certainly would be a contender. Its eyes are located at the end of tentacles. And, as seen here, when fighting conchs move from one place to another, each tentacle emerges from its own notch at the end of the shell. Like most mollusks, it has very limited vision. On the other hand, let's look at this seaweed-covered horse conch. It's about 14 inches long, much larger than the fighting conch, but its eyes are much smaller. The little black dot on the side of the tentacle is one of its eyes. A scallop's beautiful eyes may be a brilliant blue color. They allow the scallop to detect light, dark, and motion, but that's about it. This is an alphabet cone. We rarely get a chance to see their eyes, and you have to look closely to see the apple murex's eyes. They're at the base of the tentacles. Check out this handsome profile. It's an Atlantic fig snail and its eyes appear to be on its head, not on its tentacles. Do you see the skin-like structure that extends into the tip of the shell? It's called the mantle. It's the organ that builds the shell, but it also has a second purpose. When it extends out the tip of the shell, it becomes tube-shaped, and it's called a siphon. The part of the shell by it is called the siphonal canal. Water is taken in through the siphon and into the mantle cavity where it passes over the mollusk gills. They are the fringe-like structures seen here. This little mud snail looks like a dog trying to find a buried bone. Many gastropods have a sense organ inside the mantle cavity that acts much like the one that we have behind our nose. It detects chemical indicators in the water. This mud snail is probably following his siphon in search of food or maybe a mate. Scallops have two sets of gills, one on the top and one on the bottom. You can see where each set meets at the edge. Some gastropods are carnivores and hunt their prey. Others are herbivores and feast on seaweeds. Then there are the omnivores. They eat both plant and animal life. This Florida fighting conch appears to be looking for something to eat. The dark tubular structure you see is not its siphon. It's the fighting conch's proboscis. Fighting conchs have a short siphon. It is hidden inside the siphonal notch. The conch's mouth is at the end of the proboscis, and inside the mouth is a ribbon-like structure with rows of sharp teeth. It's called the radula. This is a microscopic image of a radula. It shows its length and its ribbon-like structure with longitudinal rows of strong teeth. One day when I was walking on the beach, I found a dead pear whelk. When I looked at it closely, I saw something I'd never seen before. It was a row of teeth. There are many types of radulas. I have examples of two of them. 
The cowrie's radula is used like a scraper when it's eating. This abalone's tongue-like radula appears to be more complex than that of the cowrie. This apple murex is a carnivore and is seen feeding on a Florida fighting conch. It holds the conch with its muscular foot and then enjoys its meal. Mollusks in the murex family are capable of making holes in shells in order to get at the soft-bodied animal inside. They use their radula to rasp the shell away, leaving a perfectly round hole. This can take hours to accomplish. Holes and bivalves are commonly found near the hinge where the most delicate parts of the clam's body are located. This fighting conch is being attacked by a true tulip using the very same method of action. Lightning whelks can open large cockles and clams in order to eat them. This whelk is pulling a giant Atlantic cockle towards its shell. The whelk positions the cockle so the shell margin opposite the hinge will press against the sharp lip of its shell. The whelk applies pressure on the cockle, pushing it against the lip until it pops open, as we can see here. Another apple murex is taking advantage of a lightning whelk whose meaty foot is exposed. The body of this horse conch is fully extended in order to reach this dead crab. Its face is buried in its food. It's hard to believe that big body will fit back into the shell. If you're wondering about that dark structure on the bodies of the lightning whelk and horse conch, it's called the operculum and it's one of the mollusk protection devices. When the mollusk feels threatened, it pulls back into its shell and the operculum becomes a shield against predators. This fighting conch looks like a little elephant with his proboscis in the air. He's a vegetarian, but he won't find any seaweed up there. You can see this crown conch siphon extending from the siphonal canal. Its proboscis can be seen below it. One day I found two of them feeding on a shark eye. You can see they've eaten through the shark eye's delicate operculum to get at its body. Most bivalves are filter feeders. They have two siphons, an inhalant siphon, seen here on the right, and an exhalant siphon on the left. If you watch closely, you can see how they work. This giant Atlantic cockle inhales, closes its inhalant siphon, and then exhales. Angel wings are beautiful bivalves that live buried deeply in the sand. This is what we refer to as an angel wing bed. Their two siphons are contained in one tubular structure. Water is drawn in through one and expelled through the other. Microalgae and zooplankton are filtered out of the water as it passes through their gills. Cilia move the food particles to their mouth. Waste products are ejected in the form of pellets. These pellets are sometimes referred to as pseudo-feces. Whoops, I think that was an accident. You can see a collection of pseudo-feces around these angel wings. This apple murex had planned to eat this prickly cockle, but the cockle closed the two halves of its shell quickly, in fact, a bit too quickly, and caught his foot in the process. When this sunray Venus sensed the crown conch's proboscis inside the edge of its shell, it shut quickly and trapped the conch. I tried to pry the clam open. I even used a fingernail clipper, but I was unsuccessful. Horse conchs are the top predator in the Gulf of Mexico. I found this one devouring a lightning whelk. I continued my walk down the beach, and when I returned, all that was left of the lightning whelk was the empty shell and a bit of meat on the operculum. Welcome to dawn on Sanibel's Lighthouse Beach during a minus tide. There was a recent storm and we hope we can see some live mollusks or maybe find some mollusk egg cases this morning. 
Some of the marine snails found in the waters surrounding Sanibel are of separate sexes. Like in most gastropods, you cannot determine the sex of horse conchs by their size. We know this one is a male because his body is extended and his reproductive organ is visible. Mollusks come together to mate on the ocean floor and on the mudflats. Fertilization is sometimes internal. Females in some species, like the horse conchs, produce eggs in egg cases and attach them to something solid in the water. These horse conch egg cases have been attached to a broken piece of coral. Egg cases vary in size and shape from one species to another. Two adult males accompany this large female lightning whelk. The males in this species are relatively smaller than the females. Soon after mating, the female will begin to lay a string of capsules containing eggs. If you look closely, you will see a banded tulip is attaching her egg cases on those of the lightning whelk. There can be 30 to 100 eggs in each capsule, but only 8 to 13 will hatch. Young lightning whelks will be fully developed between 45 and 60 days after the eggs are laid. Though they are very small, they look just like the adults. There can be up to 145 capsules in a lightning whelk string. So that means that 4,000 to 14,000 young lightning whelks could hatch from this string of capsules. A true tulip grows to be much larger than a banded tulip. This is a true tulip egg case. Evidently, the strong winds loosened it from the golf floor and it washed ashore. It looks like the young mollusks inside the capsule are almost fully developed. When they are fully developed, they will break through this delicate membrane on the top of the capsule and go out into the water. This open hole indicates the young whelks have left the capsule. These young tulips did not survive and were found inside one of the capsules. Shark eyes lay their eggs in a sand collar. With her foot covering her shell, she uses mucus from her foot and sand to create a base. She disperses her eggs throughout the collar and then adds another layer of sand and mucus. Basically, it's a sandwich with the eggs between two layers of sand and mucus. Female apple murex snails participate in what's referred to as communal egg laying. Numerous females simultaneously lay clutches of egg capsules in one single large mass. Banded tulips are much smaller than true tulips, and their egg cases are similar but also smaller. True tulip eggs are red, but banded tulip eggs are cream colored. Here are some of the ways mollusks get from one place to another.